Eamon Khan here for Seconds Out with World Cruiserweight Champion, the gentleman and British Boxing nominated for the British Boxing Awards nominations 2024 for Fighter of the Year. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, no, I have seen it. I, uh, I got, a, uh, got an email a couple of weeks ago. It was two awards. It's like an international mm. champion and then British male or something along those lines. But yeah, very honoured to be nominated. Yeah, you made a strong start to, for a strong case for winning that award and you look to maybe tie it up with a victory and unifying the titles against Zilda Ramirez. Great to get that over the line, Chris, a fight that's been talked about for a, a while, um, but you must be happy to you know, have that in the, in the sights now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, um, after the Richard fight, it was all eyes on, on unification um, and now we've got one. So I'm yeah, over the moon with that and... Uh, I think it's a great fight, uh, exciting fight, and um, yeah, you obviously were seeing a lot of these Riyadh cards and the, the fights and that they produce, um, and the, the I mean, the promo videos are epic. They're like films, and um, Are you getting one? I'm hoping so. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to meet Guy Ritchie, um, <laughs> but no, uh, yeah, I'd love to be part of part of that, um, and um, it's just another cool cool thing to to add to the to the list. Yeah, so you've done the home tie against Lawrence Acoli, you've done the away tie against Ratbor, now it's the neutral venue against Zoda Ramirez. Yeah. Talking about just fighting over in Riyadh, the prospect of fighting over there and maybe some of the fights that you've seen so far happen over there. Yeah, I feel like in football terms, it'd be like the Super Cup, wouldn't it? Like you get like a home leg, away leg, and then like a Super Cup to from like the European champions and then the... Uh, the American champions, I guess that's kind of what it feels like a bit. But yeah, it's uh, obviously, the, like I said, the shows and, and, and the, the, the spectacles and the, the, the cards they put on. Obviously, we just had Joshua Dubois, fantastic card. All evenly matched throughout. Um, and then this one's obviously a, a Latino night and, and based very much around, um, you know, a lot of the Mexican-Americans and stuff like that. So it's... Uh, excited to be involved I never thought at Cruiserweight I'd be fighting a Mexican but um, although he's not a typical Mexican fighter it's an honour to fight a Mexican when you're when you're a kid and you're watching all the Mexicans you know when you grow up and stuff and you know um, it's uh, exciting to be involved in in, in a huge night and uh, yeah to, you know more than anything it's that, that unification clash that I've, I've wanted Let's talk then more about Zerda I watched back actually the other day the uh, fight with Arsene Gullamarian and his entry into the Cruiserweight's uh, what do you think about that fight and specifically maybe his frame going into the cruiserweight division? Yeah, I mean, he's huge. I don't know how he ever made super middle, to be honest with you. Um, he he even looked a bit skinny at like heavy in terms of didn't have a hold much. Obviously, he, he he doesn't look like he's, you know, ripped to the bone at cruiserweight, but he's still six foot two and a half, I think. So we're not dissimilar in height. Um, really good punch output. He's brought that up with him. The Gulamirian fight, he he punched, you know, he got got caught by a, by a big punch in Gulamirian, very connected puncher. Obviously, he trains with Abel Sanchez, so he got a bit of Golovkin about him in terms of like the way he arcs his shots and stuff. And he was landing some flush shots, and Zerdo looked like he took him. He never looked buzzed at all throughout that fight. He was always firing back, which makes him a massively dangerous fighter. Um, so yeah, it's um, and you go look back through his career, and he's, he's always you know, got very good fundamentals, obviously a southpaw and, um, yeah, and, and, and super main, the main things are he's, he's tough. He's got a high out punch output, but he's also smart with it as well and can set traps pretty well. You're expecting this to be a full distance affair and an exciting one of that. Cause when I look at both of your styles, both of you happy to go toe to toe, both of you happy to box if you need to, but expecting it to just kind of explode from the off. Yeah, I've, I think so. I think um, it'll it'll be the same same me, you know, um, super high pressure, um, and just let let him let my hands go, and uh, it, it's it'll be a it'll be similar in terms of sorry, it'll be different to the Richard fight. You know, Richard I had to kind of follow a specific game plan and take his strengths away from more than work to my strengths. Um, whereas this one, I'd be, you know, working to my strengths, what I do best and, um, seeing how he deals with it. Have a look at the other fights in the division. You've got a lot of world title fights happening right now. I guess maybe it's kind of culminating, maybe, uh, a, a undisputed fight in the not too 
distant future, but you've got the likes of Mikulayan out this weekend against Rizitsky. Uh, I believe Okatai is fighting Jack Massey as well too. Just your thoughts on those two fights as the cruiserweight division continues to keep the heat up. Yeah, um, Noel McCallion, Rizicki, um Yeah, I mean, truthfully, I haven't seen enough of either of them to. to I've seen I've seen them both box, but off the top of my head, I can't think. You know, pick a winner or anything in that fight. But um, obviously, Rizicki's a huge puncher. mccallion has got more of a boxer and, and had some really close decisions against, you know, Breedis and, and people like that and put some solid performances. So that'd be an interesting one for the WBC. And then obviously the IBF is um, up to against Massey and, uh, you know, a fight I've definitely be watching. And, and, you know, obviously my plan is to get through Zerda and, and fight fight the winner of that. But um, I think, I imagine Massey's probably got a rematch, you know, sorry, up has got a rematch clause. So, in a way, everyone's been talking about me against Opatai, but Jack could could cause the upset um, and and sort of you know put a, put a stop to that potential massive fight between me and Opatai. But um, yeah, it's um, it's a, it's an interesting fight. I think it's it's exciting because you've got another Brit involved, um, a guy I know well, and um, he's you know he, he's tough. Tough guy, Jack. I think the own. I'd, I'd make up a tire favourite, um, and I think he'd just have a bit more too much speed for him. But um, Jack's tough. He's with Joe Gallagher now. Joe Gallagher fighters always had good engines, good work rate, which is what you need against up a tire, which we saw against Breedis. You know when he was um, piling the pressure on late on in the in the fights in both fights. So yeah, um, key to keep that pressure high, and Jack's going to have to stay safe for the first few rounds, but also keep pressing enough to take a little bit out of Jai, I think. And then I think second half of the site, he'll have to push on if he, he wants to, you know, come out victorious. But I mean, for me, in my in my head, it's very much Zerdo then, then Opatia. That's kind of my dream to next two fights. So um, I think that'd be, um, be, be my perfect roadmap. There has been that little bit of a perspective shift on Opatia a little bit. It seemed like he was unbeatable maybe about eight to nine months ago and then he's had these two fights with Myris Breedis and we've seen him kind of gas towards the, the back half of the fight and maybe that kind of sheen of unbeatable is kind of starting to peel off a little bit as a fighter when you look at that do you kind of start to see the the motions of a game plan running through your mind and the attributes that you bring to the ring with a fantastic engine yourself like in the future like this is something that plays into my hands just looking at it as a fighter and fighter perspective uh, yeah I mean I don't really properly study fighters and think of game plans too much until I'm actually fighting them. Um, but yeah, he's um, he's super talented. Um, Opatai, he's got does a lot of things really well. He's got quick quick hands, good feet, good shot selection, um, can punch. But I think people were saying he's like he's the next Usyk, which I I don't agree with. I think Usyk's a much much better fighter than than Opatai. Um and I think Breedis had a long layoff before the first fight, had a long layoff in the second fight, coming towards the end of his career. Um, but showed, showed glimpses of, of what, what you can do. And um, yeah, he's um, a fantastic champion, Breedis was, and um, a good fighter, but just a little bit over the hill, I think. And I think he knew that, which is why he, he retired in the end and probably didn't quite have the same in him. He had a lot of hard fights. He had two super series back to back. Um, obviously got lost to Usyk in the, in the first one and then won the second one and some t- tough, tough fights in that time. He's boxed everyone over the years. Um, and that's going to take it out of you. And I've been in his training camp and I think he overdid it in training camps. He was having spars, three spars a week, 15 rounds at some points where, you're not getting you're not getting the best work in those 15 rounds you're not he wasn't he was kind of just getting through him for the sake of getting through him and I, I personally I don't think that's the way you should do it especially towards the back end of your career um you've got to look after yourself um and that so the training camps for those fights would have also taken a lot out of him but you know you can't argue with his success he had a great career and um yeah but I think he came sort of humanized Opatia a lot in in terms of the hype for me I always see a fighter for for what they are mm. who they're fighting and, and weigh up all the variables before so I never I I, I think he's a fantastic fighter Jar but I never 
bought into the hype that he was unbeatable. Let me get your perspective on last weekend's events. We saw, for some people, a bit of a shock in Wembley Stadium as Daniel Dubois, former gym mate, defeated Anthony Joshua in a resounding fashion. I just wonder, what was your take on seeing all that unfold? And did you have that confidence in Daniel that he could beat AJ the way he did do? Um, yeah, I mean, I spoke to Sky Sports about John Dennett. Sky Sports, I just said the question marks for me were with Joshua in terms of if you look at their last three fights, Joshua had boxed Ngannou, well, last four fights, Ngannou, um, Wallin, Hellenius, and uh, Franklin. And none of them are massive punchers. Ngannou, yes, but you know, he's, he's, he's got a 0-1 and one record. He's not, not a boxer, shouldn't be fighting at that level of heavyweight boxing. Um, but it's... So, so my question marks were, AJ hasn't been with a puncher, even before that, Usyk's not a puncher puncher, you know. So, and that, when you've got some, a puncher in front of him, he seems to be a little bit more reluctant, like the Ruiz second fight, who's much more reluctant, boxed to, to orders really, really well and did the right thing. But he'd never been in there with that threat since. Whereas Daniel, the question marks for Daniel before a couple of fights, you know, in, before the last four fights were... You know, has he has he got it mentally? Can he come through the trenches? And he showed that in the last two fights before the AJ fight, in terms of the Miller fight and the Hergovic fight, where he's, you know, Miller's rough, tough, massively heavy, draining him, and he gets a late stoppage. Where Daniel's not; he's most of the time at early stoppages, um, or or he, or he flags a little bit. Do you know what I mean? But oh, I can't think of any late stoppages other than that, really. And then. The Hergovic fight was, was was similarly getting nailed a bit early on, and then come, comes through and does does a fantastic job. And then I think so for me, he'd answered the questions that he had. Always had a fantastic chin. I don't know if anyone why anyone would have thought different because he'd never been dropped heavy. He'd been buzzed against Kevin Lorena, which came came through that. That was another box tick because he came through that fight injured and still managed to get a stoppage after getting dropped and well, buzzed and dropped heavy in the first round, doing his, uh, I think he did his MCL or his ACL in his knee. Still managed to get through the fight and stop a guy who's pretty tough. Um, and then, yeah, and then obviously had the Usyk fight and that was what it was. And Usyk's, yeah, he stopped him, but it's, I think people had a few more doubts then and saying he's quit and stuff. But then after he'd come through the, the next few fights, I was like, to be honest, I think Daniel's mentally just something's clicked and he's just realised he can get through those fights now because of the Lorena fight and then the, the, the last two fights. So the question marks for me were over AJ. Um, and one of AJ's team I saw um, over at one of the Euros and I said, he's got a good chin and he can punch and he's come, it's not an easy fight because he asked me what I thought of the fight and I said... For me, the questions are marks with AJ. If he can do what he's been doing to a much lower level of competition and keep that sort of intensity, but he just never obviously got tagged early on um, and never really recovered and kind of fell apart. But yeah, um, fair play to Daniel. You know, I, I, I didn't ever, you know, um, I kind of picked him because of the question marks of, of AJ and where he's at in his career as well. But I wasn't, I was never said, yeah, Daniel's hundred percent. It's heavyweight boxing at the end of the day. Um, Daniel's hundred percent going to finish him in, you know, finish him and he'll blitz him. Like he basically did for, for five rounds. I did I'm on the night that I was sat with my mate and, uh, we were watching it at a wedding and, uh, once Daniel, I'd seen Daniel's focus. I was worried he'd be in the ring, looking around at like 96,000 and going, wow, this is something. But he wasn't. He was laser focused, looked back up for it. And I was like, Daniel, five to eight. And um, obviously got surprised it ended up going to five after the first couple of rounds. But um, but yeah, it was a, a fantastic performance from, from Daniel. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, I think, just the... You never expected to see AJ that out of his depth, I guess. I think anything changes if rematch happens. Mm, no, I don't. I don't because I'm not sure. I think 
I don't know AJ that you know very well. I've spoke to him and seen him a couple of times here and there over the years, but nothing much. Um, but to me, it just seems like he's an overthinker. And I think you can't, at that level, you can't be an overthinker. You've got to have a game plan, commit to it 110%, not second guess anything. Um, and I think that's kind of what he, he does a lot of the time. And he's had a lot of different coaches and, and stuff like that. And it's like he hasn't ever really found his feet, which I get because he's always seeking improvement. And I've always admired that about him, the way he is as an athlete and and stuff. But when it comes to that conviction of I am this, come and beat me, rather than trying to figure out this and that. And it's almost a bit like, he never really knew 100% what he was um, later on, you know, in the last couple of years for sure. Um, so it's a bit like maybe the confidence has gone to be able to be that guy who could just put his shots together and just tear up people like he was earlier on in his career. But I don't know if anything different does happen. Um, I think Danny will be the same. He's been in the gym his whole life. I think he'd just stay committed and keep training. I don't think the success would get to his head in terms of, you know, him blowing up like Andy Ruiz did, for example, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I think he'd need a massive change and a massive mentality shift, AJ, to, to change the result. Last thing, I've always wanted to ask you this as well. Like People sort of micro-analyse everything. And when it comes to that AJ Dubois fallout, people look at the ring walks and look at like how they approach or their mentality going into fight. Like you mentioned there about Dubois, whether he was looking around and things. No one can ever accuse you of that because you sort of like bottled up George Groves' essence and took it with you. And when you're on those ring walks, you just seem laser focused. Like in that moment when it goes, when you're in the change rooms to go and to make the ring walk, how have you trained to get that mentality to, to be like that? Is it just a focus you've always had? Like how do you get that switch and how easy is it to fall into that on fight night? Um, yeah, for me, it's very easy most of the time. I've had a couple of times where I haven't, um, which is probably reflected in my performances. Mastanek, Josai kind of been a bit, didn't feel like that switch had fully gone, but that was, wasn't was necessarily down to the fight. No, I was probably down to my preparations in, in camp and stuff, maybe a few things here and there and and let a few things get into my head. But um, I think when I've just, I think I've always done it as an amateur, like I've just managed to flick that switch and there's never ever been any joking in the changing room as an amateur with me. It was all laser focused, even in the gym. I think it starts in the gym. Like, I mean, you see me on the pads today, like I'm very focused. Like we have a little bit of a laugh and stuff now and again, but like when we're on the pads, I'm like laser focusing and just concentrated on, on the task at hand. And then once you do that, it's just nothing else matters. And it's, it, I guess for some people it might be hard to, but I've always ma managed to sort of compartmentalize like, the only thing that matters is what happens in that ring. And then you can enjoy everything else after, as long as you get that right. Or, and then you can, yeah. And that that's the only thing that matters. Might be easier as well, because I'm not really a, a trash talker or anything like that. So I don't put any unneeded pressure on myself in terms of not necessarily pressure, but just trying to overthink what people have said in press conference or going to say in press conference and stuff like that. But I think... Um, yeah, I've always just had a been able to just zone in. Um, there's a few sort of techniques you can do to to help that, and which I've learned over the years, but never really needed to to use them. It kind of comes automatically when once I start getting in that zone um, with regards to hands wraps and just start focusing on shadow boxing, warming up, and all, all that sort of stuff. It just it just clicks into place. Place um, and yeah, there's. Um, I think I'm lucky in that sense where I can flick that switch pretty easy on and off because, um, you know, after the fight, I can switch it off like that, which is, I think, really important. Um, and, yeah, and then obviously before the fight, switching it on as well. So, and in and out of the gym and in the spas and out the spas and stuff, it's able to be sort of malleable with that switch and just keep turning it on and off as when you need to. Um, and especially as, although, you know, boxing takes a huge up amount of my life up it's it's not life you know I have a, a home with family and you need to be able to f flick the switch between them um, obviously easier for me because I don't see them during the week so it's like training and boxer fighter mode during the week and then go home and I can just be dad and and husband so um, I think 
that's makes it easier as well to, to flick that switch. Well, Chris, thank you for not flicking the switch during this interview, <laughs> uh, but looking forward to seeing you flick that switch against Zuda Ramirez and your unification fight over in Riyadh. All the best for that, and thank you for speaking to Seconds Out, sir. Awesome.